This conference okay. will now be recorded. It is June 10th, 2020, 4 p.m., and I am going to call this uh, individually council meeting to order. Um, I will start first by reminding everybody that if you're not speaking, please mute your mics to reduce sound. Um, so I don't know if we need a quick lesson in that, how to do that, but please um, um, mute your mics. Um, and we will begin with a uh, roll call. So uh, I'll begin with uh, Councilman Couch. Here. Councilman Owen. Here. Councilwoman Kinzer. Present. Councilman Allen. Here. Okay. And I just received a text from Councilwoman Cornegay. She says, I'm on the call, but no sound. Uh, Councilman McGoffin. All right. And Councilman DeYoung. Present. Perfect. Okay. I, am, I thought that I would start, because we have moved into phase two, I'm going to start with an update that we received actually this morning from the SIT unit. and. Um, Starting right at the top, what they shared here, the new cases since the last report, which was last week, is um, 15, or 14, I'm sorry, the to total number of new cases is 14. The total number of cases is 449. Um, new deaths due to COVID is zero. Total number of deaths due to COVID is 15. Um, the total who are hospitalized currently is 51, and the total who have recovered is 308. So good news, good percentages there, all those. Sad to report those that were lost. Um, remember, just because we're in phase two, we are not exiting COVID. COVID is still very much present, and if we want to continue to move out of this and into phase three and eventually four, we must remember to wear our masks and do hand sanitizing. Um, social distancing, please remember to stay six foot apart. Um, gatherings of no more than five people who are outside your family. And um, the governor is still saying limited essential travel. So um, really hard for us, especially since we've been so isolated, but that is what he has directed. And please, please, please remember to wash your hands. Our moms were right when they told us that we needed to do that. And a reminder for those who have asked, I've received a lot of emails on this, a reminder that City Hall is a government building and it is not allowed to open until phase three. So come phase three will be open, even though uh, yesterday, as of yesterday, and I know that um, our city supervisor, Doug Merriman, is gonna talk about this. We've called everybody back together. So um, that's all that I have to say on that for right now. So moving on to approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? Madam Mayor, I move to uh, approve the agenda. This is Councilman Allen. Thank you. Second. All right. Okay, D. Young. I'm gonna. Any questions or comments? Hearing none. Um, the motion was made by Councilman Allen, seconded by Councilman DeYoung. All in favor, signify aye. by saying aye. 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 In, any opposed, aye. same sign. Any opposed, same sign. Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda, items one through four. Um, do I have a motion? Madam Mayor, this is Brenda Kinzer. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, right. Mr. McGoffin, I second. Oh, Mr. McGoffin, thank you. We'll uh, make a note that you have joined the meeting. Thank you. So I have a motion by uh, Councilwoman Kinzer and seconded by Councilman McGoffin. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Yeah, I know this is challenging because sometimes the mics are hard to get on to speak. Um, 
All right, we're going to move right into staff reports. I'm going to begin with um, Chief Klinger. And Chief Klinger, before you talk, though, I you know this has been it's been a long three months, but your team has been exceptional in having to have to meet all the requirements that have been set forth, um, not only by the governor but also by our Skagit Health Board. Um, I want to thank you and your staff for everything that you are doing and continue to do. Um, I know that there's been some challenges, but you all have accomplished them and over overcome them as you always do with um, uh, expediency and and um, and class. So. With that, Chief Klinger. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, no uh, update as far as the COVID side. Um, we have had an uptick in uh, fires. I, I'm not sure what oh. I could contribute that to. Um, we were out uh, uh, last night uh, up river um, at the Lake Tai area. Um, but uh, as far as COVID goes, uh, things are as operating as normal here. All right. Okay, thank you. Moving on to Chief Tucker. Um, and before you speak, I know that this has really been a challenging time. Um, there's police officers are under fire. Um, but one thing that I will say is that I've heard over and over again from many people within the community that they really appreciate all that you and team do, the way that you're committed to the community and you're actually quite involved in the schools and the community. So I wanna thank you for that. And I also wanna thank you for all the goodies that the public brings in to thank you and you're sharing them with me. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely. No, um, that's one of the things that's a pleasure to work here is uh, I work for good people and I work with good people and I serve good people. So um, it's a pleasure to keep on doing, um, even though the world's kind of a weird place right now. Um, uh, speaking of a weird place, we loaned out all of our uh, uh, little baby police officers, our recruits, to the COVID testing site this week. Um, they needed some uh, uh, help at the site. And honestly, the training officers were running out of things to busy work to keep them busy right now. Um, and they needed kind of a break. So we shipped them off to the COVID site. Um, our next, I guess, mission is to uh, start gearing up for 4th of July <clears throat> um, with no organized uh, parade and no fireworks display and no carnival, no logger rodeo. Um, our thoughts are that people might turn to legally obtained intoxicants and uh, other legally purchased explosives. Um, one good point we did find out, the Upper Skagit is not selling fireworks this year, um, which will be kind of handy for us. People have to go a little bit further to get their things that will blow their fingers off. Um, our, we're, I just got off the phone with a group who is planning on a 4th of July uh, freedom parade slash protest. They're calling it a protest because parades are uh, banned. Um, and we're not exactly sure where that's going to go, but we're going to have staff on anyway to manage that if it happens. Um, but it's going to start catching some momentum on Facebook. And I think they're going to schedule an event on Facebook and I'll keep you apprised as I find information out, but it might be wise to just keep um, looking at uh, what's going on, on social media in that regard. Um, we're here to just make sure people stay safe and I've already talked to the mayor and city supervisor about what we could be doing and as soon as we find out the extent of this uh, freedom protest, uh, it's actually a protest, when I got off the phone with uh, Marilyn Pineda, um, the lady who's helping organize this, she says, we are calling it a freedom, a 4th of July freedom protest, uh, protesting that there's no other events going on. So um, I think they've got some good hearted people that are interested in this. Um, and we're going to just make sure everybody stays as safe as they can. And um, that's kind of it for me. Um, we're going to start doing uh, more of a or uh, start a uh, social media push on expectations on the 4th of July. Um, if it goes up and blows up, it's, you know, safe and sane fireworks are legal. Unsafe and insane fireworks are not legal. And uh, we're going to be um, enforcing as appropriate. Um, but I'm really hoping it's going to rain like heck on the night of the 3rd or the night of the 4th. I'm, that, that would be my vote. 
um, or murder hornets would show up and everybody wants to stay inside. Um, that's all I have, Mayor. All right, thank you. All right, um, Director of Building, John Coleman. And John, Madam Mayor, it's I have good a to question have... for the Chief. Oh, yes, yeah, I have a, Mr. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Mayor, I, I have a question for Chief Klinger and a question for Chief Tucker. Uh, Chief uh, Klinger, I understand we've uh, lost one of our, our firefighters to uh, some career development over there in District Fire, Fire District 8. And I was uh, wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, that's uh, Josh Carpenter. We have that's a lot. Right. He's on temporary assignment there. He's still um, pulling his shifts here also. Okay. Good. So, he's, so he's doing double duty. <laughs> right. And and he gets to wear a chief hat over there, correct? Correct. Yes. All right. Well, that's just great for uh, the professional development that's coming out of the, our fire department. And Chief Tucker, uh, uh, a neighbor had um, one of the cars um, crashed into um, over the weekend on 11th uh, place and uh, where Sterling terminates on the east end of town. And uh, I was just wondering uh, since that was a hit and run and uh, had a conversation with the residents there that um, they had seen some frequency and uptick in some uh, speeding uh, through that area and also folks uh, um, disregarding stop signs. And I was just wondering uh, off of your tremendous memory there, what uh, uh, is this a new thing or is this a, something that uh, we're continuing to, to look at? Thank you. Oh, this is this is just an ongoing thing. It sprouts up everywhere. Everybody wants to let us know that their intersection in front of their house is the worst one in town. That we can sit in their driveway <laughs> and we'll arrest people left and right. We can actually uh, fund another officer just by writing tickets in front of their house. Um, probably not necessarily the case, but we do have a traffic issue. Um, myself and my patrol sergeants and uh, the lieutenant have been directing people to get out and do some extra traffic enforcement, because this is a pretty important um, topic for everybody that lives in town. Um, it is probably one of the most frequent complaints we get. And, uh, um, but you know, one of the things we're running into right now is summer's kicking in, military duties kicking in. Um, and I don't know if I've shared this with you, I shared with Doug and the mayor, we have four squads running right now. And uh, you may look for me here at the office uh, during the day, um, but a lot of times I am on uh, working weekends, um, alternating with uh, Lieutenant McElwraith and I are working weekend day shifts. And uh, so we're bouncing around a little bit, just trying to keep staffed up to cover people taking time off and doing all the things that people want to do. Um, I think uh, I'm covering next Sunday at 6 a.m. for somebody that's in the military. So um, we've got limited staff, but we're trying to do that as much as we can. And I do get the the our baby police officers, their eyes light up when they say, let's go out and see if we can uh, get some radar on some cars. And they have a good time with that. So we are addressing it. It's an ongoing issue. Um, we're looking for a, a better solution once we get a couple of bodies out of the academy. Chief okay, Tucker. so Chief Tucker, Mo one moving on. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Chief. A, a question. This has come up from several of my constituents. Is the speed limit 25 miles an hour down alleys in Cedar Woolley, which is very dangerous for little children that may run out? Uh, it is the speed limit 25 miles an hour in town? You in know, I'd have, to, I'd have to look and see. I That's never really come up what the actual speed limit is. And honestly, too uh, unsafe for conditions. Um, if you had an alley that didn't have any access points where people were driving faster, that's really not an issue. But if you have um, points that have, um, that it's just not safe to drive anything over five or ten miles an hour uh, we can take issue with that and typically what comes up with that is somebody will complain that my neighbor roars out of their back driveway every day you know at 7 30 in the morning and comes roaring in every night at 5 30. Um, we can take those individually 
but I'll get back to you on any actual speed limit. I know we probably talked about this 20 years ago, um, and I just don't remember what the exact answer is. So I'll do a little bit of research and send it out to the mayor and she could pass it on to the entire council. I thank you very much for that input, okay? You betcha. Okay, thank you, Chief. So moving on to Director of Building, John Coleman. John, good to see you back in the building and thank you for all the work. I'm sure it was challenging at times doing the work from home, but thank you for all the work that you did complete um, because we are moving forward with some um, building and development. So thanks to you. So, John? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, so things have been going along. Uh, every, uh, the builders have been building as much as they've been permitted to by you know state regulations. And we understand that we're, there's a bit of a backlog that people are hoping to submit stuff, but we haven't seen it yet. And we've been open since Tuesday. <laughs> um, but we were expecting a, a, a kind of a glut of uh, building permit applications over the next week or so, which would be a good thing, get people back to work. Um, I've got plenty on the agenda later today, but uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, now that, now that uh, we're able to talk about things that are more than just COVID related issues, I wanted to uh, bring up some of the things that we hadn't been able to talk to in the, in, uh, in the past several weeks. One of which was uh, back in March, the council approved accessory dwelling units. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of a handful of people call and ask about you know what they can do to to get an accessory dwelling unit, and then they inevitably say, so what are the fees going to be? And I, my reply is, well, the council hasn't had a chance to talk about that yet. If you recall, uh, when we when we passed the ordinance for the ADUs, we um, we had some discussion about what fees should be, but we gave ourselves until July 1st in order to actually come up with fees for specifically transportation impact fees, sewer impact, sewer connection fees, and park impact fees. The question being is, ADUs are smaller, do we charge a full uh, fee connection for an ADU or do we maybe not charge anything? And so Stefan made some recommendations uh, in the past and I'll give you a quick rundown on what those are in a moment. But uh, we're not going to make any decisions today. I just wanted to bring it back to the consciousness of the, the the council because at the next council meeting, I'd like to bring an ordinance to the council um, proposing something and then hopefully possibly have uh, action at that uh, June 24th council meeting so we can get some fees in place should anybody apply for um, an ADU permit, which will be possible to do uh, after July 1st. So um, that said, I just want to give a quick rundown. Um, the permit fee itself, we're, we've recommended $250 for uh, you know the application fee, and that's just the administrative part of it. And then for if someone were to have an, uh, an ADU approved, uh, they would be charged what we're recommending is uh, 60 percent of what a normal traffic impact fee would be for a ADU between the size of 451 feet and 800 square feet and that would be just under $1,500 uh, and then the smaller ADUs which are between 205 feet up to 450 feet would be $735 and then sewer connections would follow that same 60% and then 50% of that 60% for um, for the connection fee, so a, uh, a 450 square foot to 800 square foot ADU would be instead of the normal 8,500, it would be 5,182, and then smaller ADUs, which are between 205 feet up to 450 feet, would be 200 uh, $2,591 per unit, and then park impact fees would follow that same uh, prorated schedule, a normal park impact fee is $1,500, and the reduced rate would be 915 for the standard ADU and 475 for a smaller ADU. I recognize nobody has that information written in front of them, and it may sound uh, just like a lot of information that you 
probably can't remember offhand, but I just wanted to put it out there for uh, discussion purposes at the next council meeting. Um, so that's the ADU issue. Another issue uh, is the county and, uh, and all the jurisdictions in the county had been working over the past year or so on a new natural hazard mitigation plan for uh, for FEMA. And when, <clears throat> so w we uh, had all of the, the public meetings, the public hearings, sent it out to, uh, I think we brought it to council for their initial look at it at one point also, and then uh, sent it to the county to bundle it up and uh, finish their work and then send it off to FEMA. That was done, FEMA has approved it. And so now what they're asking is for all of the jurisdictions to pass a resolution saying, yes, they adopt the 2020 natural hazard mitigation plan for Skagit County. So I'll do that at the next council meeting and give you more information about that. Just wanted to let you know that that's something that's been kind of in the backlog that we haven't been able to bring to council over the past few months. And uh, so we'll be bringing that to you. And then I will be talking more about uh, things that were in the backlog later in the, the meeting. But that's all I have for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Madam Mayor, I have a question for John. Yes. John, I know it's been a few months since we've talked about this, but um, would it be possible to bring more than one proposal because I don't necessarily support the prorated approach across the board? I don't necessarily think it makes sense to you know, prorate everything the same because I think your traffic impact fees should be the same, but it might make sense to prorate uh, certain utilities. But I, I mean, we can have that discussion at the meeting, but I, I just, so the council knows where, I guess where I'm coming from, I don't agree with the, the prorated idea across the board. Uh, I can, I can work with the, with public works director on that. And cause the traffic impact fees come out of the, out of the public works transportation plan um well will be enveloped into it really we're we're trying to work on the 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 transportation uh plan and the ADU thing at the same time and kind of bring them together uh and so we can have a discussion about that and see what we can do as far as bringing you options okay yeah I, it, when we talked about it last time I I made the same request because I don't remember if I was the only one but I didn't support the the prorating of it okay thank you councilman couch and thank you John so uh, moving on to director of public works mark Freiberger welcome back from vacation and um, gosh you were quite diligent in staying in the office and working um, throughout the last three months it was um, impressive to see the work that you were getting done. Thank you, Mark. I don't see Mark Vaughn here. I don't um, either. No, I was just checking that. Okay. Um, this is director. John. Down, this yes, is John. John. I'll go down the hall and see if he's just stepped away or if he's available to hop on. Okay, thank you. Um, Director of Finance, Jill Scott. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Council. Um, as the Mayor mentioned, um, as of Tuesday, we're all back in the Finance Department. Um, it's good to be back together. Um, as you know, I started this uh, working at the City on March 9th and Within two weeks, City Hall was closed and our staff was on staggered schedule. So it's definitely been a weird start to a new job. Um, but I have to say, I am still so impressed with how well the mayor, the supervisor, all the department heads and the entire city staff has managed this crisis. Um, it actually has been really fun and enjoyable to work here. Um, on Monday, we submitted our application for the Bulletproof Vest Partnership Program. Um, which basically just reimburses us for up to 50% of uh, qualifying vests for the police department. 
And as you know, we have new officers that we need to equip as well as um, re, um, getting reimbursed for some um, best re uh, replacement. Um, we did notice an increase in the use of our online bill pay for utility payments um, during the COVID um, crisis, which has actually been a benefit because that's a more efficient way for us to receive payments. So we're hoping that that will continue even when City Hall opens. Otherwise, there's nothing um, else new for me to report other than I'm continuing to learn, keep learning curve, and looking forward to working with people now back in um, City Hall. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, I have a question for finance. Sure. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, Jill, uh, I was reading in the paper that uh, the state is uh, looking to do a 15% across the board cuts, and I am curious to know how that might impact uh, revenue here in Cedar Woolley with uh, what programs we get from the state with that potential cut. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will defer that question to Doug at this point since he is uh, definitely working in a major way on the budget. Okay, thanks Jill and thanks Carl. Um, right now I haven't heard of a state revenue stream or something like that that might be cut that's coming to us. Of course, uh, I have seen it in the past where the state has dedicated funds to us, say uh, in financing or grant funds, and we've had those swept, meaning they've changed their mind and gone ahead and pulled that money back. Mm -hmm. um, some of the grants that we have right now, they're pretty much dedicated from, say, motor vehicle fuel tax or something that can't necessarily be swept for general government purposes. So we're probably safe there, but you just never know. Uh, in times of crisis, what things happen. So you have to be prepared for those. But we haven't heard of any reductions or any plan changes like that at this time. Right. And um, Jill, I want to say that you, gosh, for somebody who came on and had to work under some um, really challenging situations, you have you know, you've picked up the ball and you've ran with it. You've done a great job and it's really a pleasure working with you and very glad that you chose to come on board and work for the city of Sijawili. So um, I know that I've already welcomed you, but now that everybody's back, I welcome you again. So thank you, Jill. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Director of IT, Bill Chambers. So um, uh, on the AV upgrade, uh, for uh, phase one for the council. Avidex has still got uh, looking for uh, a replacement for the camera controller, that uh, unit that um, seems to be on permanent back order. Um, uh, I've got a meeting uh, next week with the uh, uh, port of uh, Skagit on the, the fiber optic backbone project and uh, kind of finalizing the franchise agreement. Um, the mayor, Mark, uh, Doug, and uh, uh, Nikki, and and I will be there. Um, I'm not sure who will be there from the port, but definitely Andrew and probably one of their attorneys, I would guess. Um, lots of public surplus auction action helping out departments with that and uh, supporting uh, some staffing changes in uh, the wastewater treatment plant, uh, getting phones swapped and computers and mm. things like that, lots of fun. Uh, and uh, it's about time that we start looking at replacing the, the, uh, some of the larger business machines here at City Hall, uh, the ones we purchased over 10 years ago are a little long in the teeth, um, but if we can uh, hold off to actually purchase them next year, budget for it for next year, and and uh, um, I'll do a, a cost benefit analysis to to kind of see if it makes more sense to to lease rather than buy. Um, last time we did it, it it made more sense to buy, and and we definitely have gotten more life out of them than they generally um, um, project for a leased copier. So. That's about it for us. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I have to say, Bill, for for many years you were a, um, a department of one, 
and now there are two of you and it seems as though even though the work people would think that you know twice as many people take care of the work i think the work's tripled over the last three months and you have done a great job especially with the zoom meetings and the go-to meetings and all the updates that needed to happen helping people such as myself with the technology um i want to thank you for doing that I didn't know um, if you wanted to address the um, dates for the council meetings. Did you want to make comment about that? Because I know you did hear from the public oh, regarding that. Yeah, we had a um, um, uh, member of the public uh, comment that it could be easier on our website to uh, to indicate the 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 change in times for the starts of the council meetings. So we made some updates to the website to reflect that and uh, some things in bold and some um, um, clear um, um, presentation in many areas on the website to make sure that people are aware that um, the meetings are earlier than, than uh, they normally would be, that uh, they're virtual, um, but they can still join uh, remotely and listen. Okay. And by the way, the the um, the fact that uh, you and council approved uh, letting me hire Glenn, that's been fantastic. Glenn has been a just a, a great, not only a, a very funny individual, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's very helpful and self motivated, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, you are. You're the dynamic duo. You really do a great job. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I'm going to go to City Attorney Nikki Thompson. Nikki? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I am very excited that we've moved into phase two because that means that we're closer to reopening uh, government. Yeah. And um, certainly one of my challenges thus far has been not being able to have that contact with City Council and to build that relationship with council. So I'm very much looking forward to moving through these phases so that I can um, build the relationship that I'm building with the department heads and the mayor with the council as well. So um, beyond that, as you all know, my work is largely behind the scenes and I don't have anything to add. Hmm. Um, well, I do. I have to say that you've actually been incredible picking up the ball and running with it again. Um, um, you know, you have found situations here in Cedar Woolley where we, we kind of had some um, some tightening and tweaking that we need to do, and you've actually been um, helping us do that. You're going to help us move through that tonight. I hope um, all the council members did receive your email um, regarding the um, the appearance of fairness. Uh, so, um, thank you, Nikki, and we'll hear from you in just a bit. And uh, then uh, to our city supervisor, Doug Merriman, who really, oh my gosh, you're somebody who <laughs> took a new position and started filling a lot of uh, other positions uh, to get things done. And especially since we moved into COVID, um, Doug, really, really glad you're on board. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor. And it's been uh, fun, actually. Uh, we've all had to reinvent and kind of stretch ourselves a little bit as a team and everybody's jumped right in it and for the most part we haven't skipped a beat we've still been doing business uh unfortunately we don't have customers and our our citizens coming in the door but hopefully that won't be far off and we can be back to our normal course of business so a few of the things i've been working on that might be of council interest is uh, primarily around money, of course, uh, even though uh, not so much in the finance area, but uh, the logistics of going after a CARES grant money and those things. So I've been working with the department heads uh, as far as what things would apply. Uh, we have, with final signatures, we'll be sending that into Commerce, our contract, and be starting to actually tally up those things we can send in to get reimbursed. Uh, right before this meeting, I got off a teleconference with a number of other cities and the Department of Commerce, and we're able to hear some of the fine tuning and things and suggestions that Commerce has for us to apply for. So that's really helpful, and uh, we're looking to get as much as we can from those. So that would be good. Uh, the affordable housing sales tax, we did complete that at the last meeting. 
I am working with uh, the Department of Revenue. Uh, they have all our information and we'll be launching that one probably the 1st of August is when we start collecting sales tax for that program. So that's done. We've got that one wrapped and we'll, we should see that starting here in another few weeks. And speaking of the Department of Revenue, uh, this week I did get access uh, to their database. And what this gives me is I had to sign a confidentiality agreement, but I do have access to the sales tax data from all our businesses. So what I'm able to do is go in and kind of divide them by sector or type of business, and I can track and monitor how we're doing sales tax. Uh, hopefully it won't just be a shock at the end of the month when we get a check and we see it's less. Uh, we'll actually be able to see certain things. Uh, for example, the end of May, we got a check that was more than we thought. And I thought that was interesting because with some of the shutdown, we thought it would be less. Uh, we were surprised to learn the number one sales tax producer in the city in March was Amazon. And maybe that's not such a surprise because as people didn't go out and shop, they were definitely ordering and having things landing on their porch. So it's just interesting seeing those trends coming out of there and that helps us try to project what we think the impact will be. Uh, the next item, if you've driven down State Street lately, you've seen herds of people climbing all over the library building. And it's been really good. We've been wrapping up, uh, getting the roof on, and getting all the flashing and all those pieces done. Uh, today, we were uh, finalizing up getting the utilities hooked up, at least the water system, and getting all those things. So it's kind of nice getting out of concrete and beams and actually starting to get into those things that are gonna be the final stages of the library project. So that's a good sign. Uh, as of right now, we're aiming for maybe the mid to the third week of September to be substantially complete with construction. Uh, it'll take a little time then to get the bookcases in and the books and the people and everything else. But we're moving along. We're still on budget at this time, and uh, that project's going well. And uh, one thing under the, the CARES grant, um, there are a number of different programs we have there. And I know Mayor Johnson has been working on a really interesting one she'll share with you. But I've just been working with her on uh, the logistics of getting that put together. Uh, as you've heard before, staff are back in the office. And we've gotten to reintroduce ourselves and kind of get reacquainted, all with masks on and from at least six feet away. So we're following the safety guidelines that we should, and it uh, feels good just to have everybody back together. So I appreciate everybody's work. And that's the end of my report. All right. Good. Thank you, Doug. And, um, you know, I just can't help but um, praise the staff that we have been working with. Um, I know I've never really done this before, but there's nothing like a crisis or a situation where you have to come together and um, think outside of the box and do some extraordinary work. And I have to say, um, we have done some extraordinary work, and it's because of the extraordinary staff that I am working with. And um, also, I want the council to know that you have been, your support has been tremendous. And through the um, weekly and sometimes biweekly um, statements that I've put out to you, reports that I've put out to you, and um, I have thanked you, and I sincerely mean that. Um, you know, you're the one who really helps us get through this um, and to make sure that um, the public is, is, um, uh, being seen and being heard and, um, you know, the comments that you made and, the, and the, the words of support that you've shared, I've appreciated. So with that, I will start the um, council comments and council reports, and I will begin with Councilman Couch. Madam Mayor, nothing to report at this time. I will have uh, a couple questions under new business. All right, thank you. Councilman Owen. Yeah, I have a couple of things. Uh, I want to pass out uh, three halos, one to Bill and, and one to Doug and one to you, Mayor. I know you've worked oh. real hard to, to get us back, get us into phase two. And a big thanks to the county commissioners and the other mayors. Uh, down the road, not too far, we'll be able to go to phase three. But anyway, it, it's an improvement. and. 
uh, we all appreciate uh, your hard work and Bill has pretty well perfected the the camera situation and it's really good tonight and it's been a pleasure to sit here and watch Chief eat. I can't <laughs> better pass them over some some biscuits or something. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that that's about all I have. And a big thanks thanks to all all the people down there, even the chief. They're all doing a good job. So thank you very much. And that that's all I have to say. I'm gonna shave one of these days. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for your kind words. Um, moving on to Councilman Allen. Oops, did I turn it on? <laughs> you did, you did. Oh, I did good, okay. Anyway, I, I just, uh, kudos to the city staff. I, I really think that uh, I've lived here most of my life and it's incredible on how well the staff works with the citizen. Uh, Nathan presented something to him. He went to his supervisor. I'm sure uh, Chief Tucker, you know, will check into the alley speed limit. It just, people in Cedar Woolley, our staff follows through on things. And I'm greatly appreciative. Okay? All right, thank you. Um, Councilwoman Cornegay, I'm not sure if you were able to get the volume to work. I just print, yeah, I just finally, I couldn't even log Perfect. on at first, but I finally Perfect. got it. Yeah, so I'm on my phone now. <laughs> okay. um, I actually, I uh, just wanted to ditto everything everyone else said. Um, nice job, everybody. I'm hoping that we, that we stay at least in phase two and move forward and not have to ever go back. I hate to be the Debbie Downer, but I just was wondering if we have preparations for just in case that was to happen, like it is in other states, that um, you know they have to kind of go backwards, take a couple steps backwards. If we are preparing for that at all, and um, <laughs> I don't know if that's even come up. I missed the first part of meeting trying to get logged on, but um, that was one thing I had to say. And and another thing I was wondering is um, I just wanted to thank our police department and um, as a person of color, I I have to say really thinking, even if I think really hard about it and think about every detail, I can't think of any time I've ever felt unsafe here. Um, and I just wanted to give kudos that I'm, I can proudly say that I've never experienced not even a touch of anything in, in our city or even in our county. Um, and I, I do find out that we do already have a community policing in our city. We don't have it on paper, but we already practice it as a policy and as a philosophy. And I just want to thank them for that and continuing that work and, you know, getting in touch with our students in the schools and just being out and about. And the, the Facebook page is amazing. And all of those things really help. You know, our police department is really well liked. So, so anyways, and I didn't know if, if that question, the earlier question was for Doug um, about, you know, being ready for who knows what, knocking on wood that that doesn't happen because business has been really great. <laughs> I can go ahead and touch on that one. Okay. Uh, one of the downsides to COVID is that we've been uh, at home, a lot of us, and working under that environment. One of the good sides about it is that we've been all at home working and being in that environment. So uh, it's given us a lot of practice on telecommuting and, and using platforms like this one. Uh, if the unfortunate thing were to happen and we had to drop back and punt, we would just go right back to these same policies and the same operating procedures we've been doing the last couple of months. Uh, so there wouldn't be that much change, really. It would just get scarce around here as far as people again. Uh, but we're well versed at it. We've had a lot of practice now, so we would still be able to keep things moving. Right on. And yeah, sorry. Well, I was gonna. I was just gonna make a comment. One of your first questions was, "Are we able to handle the situation if we have an increase in COVID cases?" And that was actually one of the 
requirements by um, the governor's office for any kind of county to move forward was um, showing that they did have um, enough hospital beds, um, enough PPE. Um, Chief Klinger, you might want to step in and help me here. Um, I, testing, the testing was to continue. There was a criteria of nine. I think they increased it um, right before they moved us into phase two or yeah right before they moved us into phase two but um i know they they are looking to make sure that we're doing what we need to be doing in case we do we do slip back have have an outbreak knock on wood <laughs> yeah uh, yeah. yeah thank you uh-huh chief Klinger, did you have any more to add to that or no we're with our uh, um Cooperative purchasing with the, the DEM and the other cities and the PPE that we have on hand, if we were to take a step backward, we uh, we would be well covered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Okay. Um, Councilman McGoffin. Hi, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Um, I well, I'm curious about the contest. How's how was that going? And and um, it should be winding down here pretty quick, right? Yes, it actually wrapped up um, pretty soon here in like a few minutes. So there weren't very many submissions, but the ones that did get submitted had lights on them. And I did hear about it in the community. Uh, people liked the idea and they liked seeing the videos, but people were kind of shy to upload. I think so. <laughs> we didn't get very many submissions, but it was still well, fun. I yeah, it was, and I appreciate your efforts and the time and commitment that you put into that. It's, it was a fa fabulous suggestion, and, and it is fun. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. And Councilman DeYoung. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just am walking around the neighborhood, just so uh, impressed with uh, folks' resiliency and uh, seeing a lot of uh, uh, what we would call victory gardens uh, popping up in front yards and backyards and also some some uh, great play areas that have been developed uh, with uh, kids being more at home and just seeing the, the family uh, uh, nucleus coming together in Cedar Woolley. It's just a, a great thing to see. Uh, additionally, continuing to be a resource to our federal folks on the HEROES Act, uh, giving them information as, as uh, asked on uh, how that would be helpful uh, in in our city. Uh, additionally, uh, just encouraging folks, please, please remember to wash your hands, to keep the social distancing. We want to keep we want to keep moving forward. We don't have to slide back. Remember to wear your mask, um, have them, and uh, it's great to be able to get uh, a bite to eat in town, isn't it? And uh, just uh, exercise some patience if they're at 50% capacity and, and you might have to wait a little bit, but it's it's great that we can spend money locally again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, I only have a couple of items. The first one that I want to mention, um, uh, Doug alluded to it. So um, in a um, conversation I was having with Commissioner Janicki, it was, I was made aware that um, through the CARES Act, our city may be able to put together a grant that would allow, or grants, I should say, that would allow for small businesses to apply for. So I uh, did some research, got a hold of John Sternlich at EDASC, um, started inquiring as to what that would look like. Um, went back to Doug and I said, uh, this is what I'd like to see happen. What are your thoughts? How do we make it happen? Doug was more than helpful. Um, we came upon the um, the uh, determination that we would put together, we would take $50,000 and of that we would um, make offer grants up to $5,000 for small businesses in town um, who have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. and um, we are going to work with EDASC through this. Um, we are waiting, though. The criteria is that we are waiting to hear from Commerce to give us the go-ahead. We want to make sure that we um, are accurate in our assessment and, and uh, that we're moving forward um, uh, uh, in the right manner. So more to come on that. I'm really hoping that it does pull together. Um, 
we're hoping to put this together fairly soon and um, so that so that businesses who are awarded uh, the monies can do what they need to do and I will let you know but very exciting um, that we can do that we we'll put together a grant for our businesses so um, anyway I will share more on that later um, also I have received um, from different people a they're asking me to um, they want me to make statement regarding what's happening and I think as a mayor and as a city council we we made a very clear statement back um, in November um, when we put together the um, it's the mayor proclamation of Cedar Woolley for inclusion and that is on our website so I encourage people to go to that um, I you know I think um, it's been stated by everybody here. We have a great, we have a great community, and um, and uh, I, 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 you know, we just want to celebrate everybody, and um, we want to support those where we can. So, um, for for those who are asking, um, if you want to go to the website, check it out, and then if you have any comments or feedback, I'd be happy to receive that. Thank you. Okay, so then moving on, normally at this time we would have public comment. Um, unfortunately, we're unable to receive it at this time. It is closed. Um, however, uh, if you provide written questions or comments via email or by letter, um, we will uh, put them into the um, minutes. So uh, thank you for bearing with us as we, as we do this. Mayor, uh, this is Mark. I came yes. on late. Sorry about that, but I am available oh, no. to the report. Yeah, I we'd love to hear it. Thank you, Mark. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so what tied me up for a few minutes is uh, FEMA had actually given me a call following up on an email they sent while I was on vacation. Uh, they have a, a small uh, program as well that they're encouraging us to apply under. So I'll discuss that uh, with uh, you and Doug uh, tomorrow and see if there's anything we want to do on that uh, light as well. They have funds available for losses over three thousand dollars and and up to a hundred and some thousand so another possible source for some funds All right. uh, as far as public works is concerned getting caught up again after my my vacation the last couple of weeks uh, of course david lee is preparing for the construction start for the sr20 lane widening project uh, we're expecting them to be out probably in August doing uh, the prep work for that. Uh, there's a couple of log and lead time items on that. The new culvert that's going in to provide the access for the uh, Skagit Behavioral Health Facility. And uh, also we're having to put a uh, kind of a fancy valve on the end of our storm line to keep the fish from swimming up that. That, that was also a long lead time item. Uh, our Jameson overlay project is out to bid and closes on the 18th. And uh, we're hoping to have that on the council agenda for award on the 24th. Uh, due to the drop in oil prices, uh, we're seeing and hearing that there's uh, excellent pro uh, bids coming in on asphalt right now. So we're looking forward to that. Save us a few dollars, hopefully, there. Um, we also have out to bid uh, a paving project for the new parking lot. If you haven't been by there, uh, Nathan and his team have been working very hard on Hauser Park. Uh, the new path is, has been installed all the way around the site and uh, they're finishing the grading for the parking lot uh, today, as a matter of fact, putting the base on. So they'll be ready to pave as soon as we have a contractor set up for that. And they're putting the roof today on, probably finished uh, putting the sheeting on for the restroom facilities. That's all looking pretty good. And, and I think you'll be uh, pleased if you take a look at that and have a chance to walk on the, the path. I understand it's being well used already by neighbors, uh, dog walking and those kind of things. So I believe that's gonna be a very, very uh, nice uh, continued asset for the city. We have a number of things happening down at the wastewater plant. Uh, we are in the process of transitioning leadership from Debbie Allen, who's retiring on August the 21st, uh, to Kevin Wynn, our new super superintendent. And uh, that's going well. Uh, we started them back with a full crew about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, well, on June 1st anyway, not quite two weeks. And uh, they're, they're spending their time together, uh, getting ready for that, that uh, 
handover of operations. We're pretty pleased with the way that's going so far. Uh, we've got a good team in place there with the new hire we did recently. And um, in addition, uh, they're having some issues with our rotors on our uh, oxidation ditch. We're going to have to do uh, one of our small works contracts to uh, pull two of those out and replace the rotor blades and put new bearings in. One of them has already failed and it's off and we can only be down one at a time, uh, but we're figuring uh, the two larger ones, they're both the same age. Uh, it's been seven years since we did the last bearings and the last uh, replacement of the blades. And so we'll do both of them uh, when we do that sometime in the next couple of months. I am waiting for the final plans from Brown and Caldwell for our electrical system uh, upgrade. And I expect to have those this week and get that out to bid. You should see something on that in the next couple of council meetings. We've received the parts for our diffuser upgrade and our uh, aeration basins. And uh, we'll be putting a contract out to do that. Uh, that's one of those things that's a very specialized thing. Uh, the company that furnish the equipment also has a, a another arm that does installation and I'm going to be looking at pretty closely at doing a sole source for that uh, it's pretty specialized work there's some there's some real warranty issues with uh, it, if you had an inexperienced contractor putting those in and I'm going to look carefully at doing that as a sole source so you'll see something on that at the next council meeting if we're able to go forward with that uh, the BNSF bridge project that we have money, uh, hopefully through the legislature on, we're still working on a contract with WashDOT Rails. We had one negotiated uh, and then their director refused to sign it. Uh, it was a case of where they tried to use a cookie cutter contract uh, that was based on one we've used in the past for local programs, but with a few nuances. Uh, and it simply had some restrictive language in it that uh, we had discussed uh, the city attorney and I, and and uh, we came up with a right way of handling that uh, that satisfied their staff, but their director wouldn't sign it. So it's back now for them to prepare another contract to, um, uh, that it will address both of our concerns. And I'm really hoping that this delay doesn't put us in the crosshairs for this budget reduction that we're hearing about. And I do worry about that, but we're moving ahead as if that's going to happen. And uh, we're also in a parallel uh, mode of negotiating with BNSF on their contract. They've had our draft in hand for over a month now and have been kind of dragging their feet, I think waiting to see that we get the contract with WashDOT Rails. They have, however, been out uh, to look at the site and I have a meeting with them on Friday uh, to look at it with PSE uh, regarding how we're gonna handle the interface with the high voltage lines across that site. So. The signs are good that they're they're still motivated to do that work. Uh, they are, however, also reeling under the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, their revenues have dropped 70% on some of their runs, and so they're they've announced some pretty massive layoffs system-wide, and that could well affect their engineering and construction departments. So anyway, we'll stay tuned on that and and hope that things go okay. I, we're, we're thinking that having something to do like this with their own crews would be a good thing. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we have on the next council agenda, the uh, public hearing and first read for the 2021 to 26 tip. And so that'll be coming your way. Yeah. Uh, we did not run that through the planning commission as we have the last few years uh, because of the restrictions on uh, public hearings that uh, were in place at the time. That's now been kind of rectified, but we'd already moved down this road. So we're gonna continue with this process of the council doing the public hearing as well as the uh, reads and adoption on that. I uh, have been writing uh, the last couple of days, the application for uh, Skagit County Economic Development Grant that you approved at the last council meeting. And uh, that grant will provide about $450,000 towards match uh, for a TIB project in August, and the project, of course, as you saw from that memo, is is an intersection improvement at SR9 and McGargle. Yeah. Uh, it's a needed improvement. It's one that's mm -hmm. needed regardless of whether the corridor uh, goes forward or not. Uh, it'll it'll improve the safety at that intersection in the peak hours in the morning and evening, and 
make it easier for the school children to get across as well. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, I did call the director of TIB to discuss that, to make sure that kind of fit in their uh, desires to support our quarter project. When we were in Olympia, uh, Ashley Pulbart was one of our uh, appointments there, and he was very excited about the overall corridor project. And, and he did affirm that he's very supportive of the project and, and encouraged us to submit the application. So I think if the county is, is able to uh, provide us with the funds we're requesting, that that's going to be a project that we'll be able to go forward with design in 2021 and construct in 2022. Uh, also coming up for uh, a, a near-term council meeting would be our sewer comp plan. Uh, we've had that finished for a while and would have already brought it to your attention, but for the COVID-19 restrictions, but we would like to move that forward. That's going to include uh, our recommendations uh, for how ADUs are handled, and I understand that was discussed earlier, uh, and we'll discuss that internally between us and building and planning and up with a plan on that but uh, we do have that uh, uh, right now that particular nuance in the plan set up to match what we've done with our transportation impact fees as well uh, they're set up to uh, mirror those those same rates for ADUs uh, sorry for all of that stuff to discuss but you haven't heard from me lately so we had a few things to bring to your attention and that's all I have thank you all right. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, it's a lot. You have a lot of balls in the air for sure. Um, I have a question actually for you and John regarding the ADUs. I am wondering if there's a possibility, especially for Councilman Couch, because it sounds like he has some very specific questions. Is there a way that maybe he could connect with you and there could be some conversation there so that when we get to the council meeting, um, there might be a couple of options to offer us? Certainly no problem on my end. Uh, John had sent me an email while we were uh, uh, earlier in the meeting telling me about that uh, discussion with Councilor Member Couch. So yeah, we can arrange something on that. Okay, yeah. So Councilman Couch, if you're okay with that, if that's something you're willing to do or have time for. Sounds great. I'm more than happy to talk to Mark and John anytime. Yeah, good, thank you. All right, thank you for bringing your um, concerns forward. Madam Mayor. Yes. I had a question for Mark. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I received a report just before the meeting from someone who lives by the Winnie Hauser Park. And he had talked to the city um, earlier in the day and then yesterday about fencing. Um, he was told a couple years ago that there would be fencing around the housing to prevent people from parking in their lawns. But then he was recently told that that was no longer um, in the budget. And so I was wondering if we could just maybe get some clarification on that. I'll, I'll talk to Nathan and, and see what uh, what's going on with that. I know he has some funds uh, or some plans to put fencing to continue the the perimeter fencing, uh, especially around the uh, where uh, at which would be down towards the prospect area. Um, I'm not sure what your complainant would have meant to keep them from parking in their yards that problem was related to SUNIC itself we have no control over that it's a county facility a county street uh, but i'll follow up and, and find out what the what our okay thank you thank you i have a, i have a question also for mark this is for me sorry i was wondering uh the the stacy street um development do you know how much parking, extra parking, there? do you know offhand how much extra parking they're planning to have there? On on State Street? Stacy, that Stacy Street development, I think, is it Stacy Street? Actually, I'm not real sure where that's at. Um, so this, this is John, uh, John Coleman. The, okay. So Stacy Street is off of Trail Road. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, I think there's three off street parking spaces that we required them to have. And then there's only about two, probably just two or three on street parking, maybe, maybe not even that many. Okay. That's, that's not a lot because those are pretty big homes. But okay. Thanks. Okay. So. 
All right. Um, that concludes the reports. So now we're on to new business. And um, so tonight's agenda contains two matters that qualify as quasi-judicial in nature. So I'm going to turn this over to our attorney, um, Nikki Thompson, and Nikki is going to lead us through this process before we uh, look at uh, possible um, resolutions for the preliminary plat for garden, garden meadows and also for brickyard. So, Nikki? Thank you, Mayor. Hopefully you all have seen my email. Um, sometimes when we change attorneys, we change processes, and this would be one of those changes that I would like to move forward with. So, um, prior to staff presentation on quasi-judicial matters, it's important to determine whether or not the appearance of fairness doctrine requires any member of this body to refrain from deciding the matter. So in light of that, I'm going to ask you some questions before I turn it over to Mr. Coleman. Um, does any member of this council have knowledge of or have conducted business with either the proponents or the opponents of this plat? No response, Count I will say that as a no. Council member DeYoung, no. Thank you. Does any member of this council have either a pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest in the outcomes of this proceeding? Please define pecuniary. Financial. This is council member DeYoung, no. Nikki, are you wanting people to give uh, an answer or are you just looking for a yes if people have how would you like to handle this do you want to roll call right. so, so typically um it, i've never done this on a zoom meeting and so typically i um watch people's faces and just say seeing none and i proceed but since we're on zoom um how about if you have a yes answer then you identify yourself and um answer that you that you that you're answering yes all right perfect thank you nikki Sure thing does any member of this council know whether or not their employer has a financial interest in the property or the area which will be impacted by the decision in this proceeding? Hearing none. Does any member of this council live or own property within 300 feet of the area which will be impacted by the decision in this proceeding? Hearing none. Does any member of this council have any special knowledge about the substance of the merits of this proceeding, which would or could cause the council member to prejudge the outcome of this proceeding? Hearing none. Is there any well, we member have, of this we, we have received public comment about it and we have had people come testify before it. So could you Absolutely. give us a little more of the boundaries of what we're looking at the guardrails, please? So um, anything that has been received as public comment is actually a part of the record. Um, what we're talking about here is things that you may have gained that are outside of the record. Um, if you've had conversations with people, if you have um, special behind the scenes knowledge that you've gained by virtue of connections you might have or, um, or your own employment, things like that. Something that is outside of the record. Thank you for that. Sure thing. So is there any member of this council who believes that he or she cannot sit and hear this matter both fairly and impartially as to the respective positions of the proponents and the opponents in this proceeding? Hearing none, has any member had any ex parte contacts concerning this matter? Um, contacts that have been uh, with members of the community that may not be reflected in the record is what we're looking for here. Hearing none. So typically we would ask members of the audience um, if anyone wishes to disqualify any council members um, for potential appearance of fairness issues. Since we are on Zoom, and that's um, something we can't really do. Um, is there any member of council that wishes to disqualify any other member of council um, because of a concern about the appearance of fairness doctrine? Hearing none, I will turn it over to Mr. Coleman. Okay, thank you. So the, the first item on the new business agenda is the preliminary plat of Garden Meadows. 
The preliminary plat is a 28 lot uh, residential subdivision. Uh, at the property is located at 606 FNS Grade Road. It connects FNS Grade Road to James uh, to Jones Road and uh, is aligned with the um, with with Garden of Eden Road. The western version of Garden of Eden Road would uh, continue down through this property if this project were to be approved and constructed. Of the 28 lots, um, there's uh, three duplex lots, so it's a total of 31 units. Um, the map, for uh, anyone who wanted to see it, is on page 85 of the council agenda. And um, there was a public hearing for this. Um, the hearing examiner uh, held the hearing and received public comments, both written and and orally, and rendered a recommendation to the city council. That city that uh, recommendation is attached to the um, to the proposed resolution, uh, which would grant preliminary approval of the plat of Garden Meadows. This is a fairly standard um, lot. It's not proposed as a planned residential development. It meets standard lot uh, zoning size requirements for lots and um, duplexes are an allowed use in this zone and they meet the zoning requirements for duplexes. It has a residential play area that would be owned by the Homeowners Association and has proposed amenities. Those are also included in the record. And um, staff has found that the, for it meets all zoning requirements and uh, other um, city regulations. It, it meets the regulations of the other city regulations, excuse me. And um, the recommendation from the hearing examiner is uh, to approve the resolution uh, to approve the preliminary plat of Garden Meadows, subject to the conditions in the hearings examiner findings. That's a, that's about all I have to offer on this. Um, it's a fairly standard long plat application, and all of the comments are included within. Okay, so are there any questions, uh, comments uh, from the council for John? Okay, hearing none, um, uh, the action is requested, and this would be resolution 1053-20. Um, do we have a motion to move forward with this? I'm a little slow. I'm sorry, um, Madam Mayor. I was looking at the map. I did have a question before we get into the motion. Or do you want to do questions while we're in discussion? Well, I just I just called for the motion. So, well, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Okay. So, uh, John, what's there now? Right now, there is a single-family house and a a field that has not been used for any act agriculture or there hasn't been any animals on it it's just been a vacant lot this lot uh, the same lot was approved for uh for a fairly similar preliminary plat approval back beef in 2000 oh gosh i forget 2007 i want to say but then the, the economy the great recession happened and the that project went by the wayside preliminary plats have a shelf life they're only good for a certain amount of years so um, you know, once uh, since nobody was able to build it before that that time ended, it, they were required to uh, when new property owners took possession, they were required to go through the platting process again. Right, well, because you know credit became really really hard. Um, so my my question then is impact fees. Uh, so the, how many units are coming in? So this would be 31 units. Um, for, uh, I mean, there's so there's 28 lots. Three of them are duplex lots. They can build single-family houses on the duplex lots. I doubt that would happen. There'd probably be duplexes, but so um, so it would 
would be likely 31 units. All right. I would, mention, I would and... mention, this is Mark, if uh, you don't mind my hey, Mark. This. Uh, so this project, it has an interesting nuance in that it is on the alignment for our proposed uh, Jones John Liner Trail corridor. So the requirement yeah, I see that. For, the requirement for the developer is to build that section of road for us, which is a very positive thing for us. They'll they'll dedicate the right of way and actually build the improvements. And uh, in exchange for that, they'll be eligible for both transportation and sewer impact fees in there. So I don't expect that they'll be paying a lot of actual fees, but we'll get the benefit of getting the road actually built and the right of way dedicated, which which is a really good impact uh, nice. good result for us. Yeah. Yeah, you anticipated my my next and final question. So thank you very much for teaming up on that. Madam Mayor, just confirming this would be 1053? Yes, 1053-20. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the uh, resolution number 1053-20 regarding preliminary plat approval. All right. Do I have a second? This is Jermaine. Second. This is Jermaine. Thank you, Jermaine. So I have a motion by Councilman Couch, seconded by Councilwoman Cornegay. Any more questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, opposed? Same motion? Same. What? You, can you hear me? I'm getting that from Carl. Um, so on Mayor, opposed? I'm, I'm receiving packet loss from you. So yeah, um, you have a little lag. Those opposed? So hearing none, the motion carries. Motion to adopt resolution 105320 to approve the preliminary plat of Garden Meadows subject to the conditions contained, contained in the hearing examiner's findings of fact conclusions and recommendation. Thank you, Council. All right, John, we're, or actually, Nikki, do you need to, uh, with, with the questions for both of the plots, or do you need to do that for this one as well, for the Brickyard Park? So technically, each um, plat is a separate agenda item. It's a separate quasi-judicial process, and so technically, we need to do it a second time. But I okay. will okay. through it quicker this time because you've heard it once. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Go ahead. So does any member of this council have knowledge of her or have conducted business with either the proponents or the opponents of this of this PRD? Hearing none. Does any member of this council have any financial interest or non-financial interest in the outcome of this proceeding? Hearing none. Does any member of this council know whether or not their employer has a financial interest in the property or area which will be impacted by the decision in this proceeding? Hearing none. Does any member of this council live or own property within 300 feet of the area which will be impacted by the decision in this proceeding? Hearing none. Does any member of this council have any special knowledge about the substance of the merits of this proceeding, which would or could cause the council member to prejudge the outcome of this proceeding? Hearing none. Is there any member of this council who believes that he or she cannot sit and hear this matter fairly and impartially, both as to the respective positions of the proponents and the opponents in this proceeding? Hearing none. Has any council member had ex parte communications regarding this matter? Hearing none. Yes, I have uh, that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that, uh, this, that's in my ward and I've had questions, I've had uh, concerns uh, passed on to me, but I haven't really got involved in it other than speak whatever at the council meetings and uh, just addressing their concerns. And that's basically all, all the contact I've had with them. Okay. And do you, and do you feel like you can um, fairly and impartially hear the matter, even though you've heard um, things from out in the community? Sure. Wonderful. So I will turn this back over to John. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council, for going through that again. So uh, this is uh, for the preliminary plat approval 
of the plat of Brickyard Creek, which is a planned residential development. This uh, this is a 85 lot planned residential development. Um, it would it is proposed as a age restricted development for residents 55 years or older. The property is located on McGarrigal Road. It is unaddressed. It is parcel 3937. 39374 per the Skagit County Assessor's parcel numbers. Uh, it is 12.7 acres and it is vacant and it is in the residential zone. Um, again, the hearing examiner's findings of fact, conclusions, and recommendation is attached and has the extensive history of this project. The map of the proposed subdivision is Exhibit T to the Hearing Examiner Finding the Fact and conclu Conclusions and Recommendation. And so that is on page 582 of your council packet. And um, that's the, the whole 85 units. And then the previous five pages from that shows uh, section by section with a little finer detail. So um, as, a, as a, a PRD, this uh, has proposed a larger re uh, recreation area than a standard subdivision in exchange for being allowed to have smaller lots. So this used the, the PRD regulations that the city council approved about a year and a half ago. and um, we, the, the staff and the hearing examiner reviewed it for technical compliance with the zoning regulations, the PRD regulations, as well as other infrastructure regulations and found that it does meet the, the technical requirements. Um, this project was, uh, has drawn a lot of attention from the, the neighborhood and um, there was a, when the public notice of the application and SEPA comment period went out. Um, we received several comments and then we were able to issue a SEPA determination, a, a, a mitigated determination of non-significance. That included several items uh, as mitigation to make sure that there was no addition, no impacts beyond uh, what would normally be expected. Uh, for a development. And that MDNS was appealed by a group of neighbors and it had its uh, appeal hearing on March 24th. The uh, hearing examiner heard that appeal and held the appeal period open for a couple of days to uh, make sure that everybody was able to um, submit, addition, uh, submit information uh, as part of that appeal process. The hearing examiner then rendered a decision to, um, he found that the uh, MDNS was sufficient and uh, did not, uh, did not, uh, did not uh, approve the appeal. So uh, the appeal was then set aside and uh, allowed for the project to then continue. The complete description of it is in the hearing examiner findings. It is a lengthy document and mm -hmm. uh, it is about 575 pages. I apologize for the length, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure that council has all of the information that the hearing examiner and uh, the appellants and everybody, all of their information was in there. So, um, There's uh, there's not a whole lot more to say about it. The um, it has drawn a lot of attention, and it is a PRD. The hearing examiner does make a recommendation to approve, and uh, so it is before the council now for them to uh, make a, a decision on a, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat of Brickyard Creek subject to the conditions contained in the hearing examiner's findings, facts, and conclusions and recommendations. Okay, well, are there... John, 
I got a question, John. Uh, I'm not happy with the, with the traffic situation, and I don't think the it's been addressed. Uh, it's not been addressed enough to suit me because that is that is a congested area, especially when schools in very dangerous area, and and 85 units is going to put a lot more traffic on that McCargyle, and and. I, I don't know what you people have in mind to, to tackle this thing. Do you have any plans? Or? So there is a uh, transportation there's a transportation impact study that was done by the the applicant as part of this. That's required for any larger development, uh, whether it's a you know a commercial development, a school, a, uh, a large subdivision, a multifamily, something like that. So that was that was uh, done and it is part of the record. I'm looking to see what page uh, that is on. Um, the city public works department and city engineer reviewed it and uh, then sent it um, also to uh, make sure that it was adequate, sent it for a third party review to a, another transportation company to review. Again, this is all part of the record. The, the third party reviewer found that it was adequate. In addition to the that traffic study, the city commissioned their own citywide transportation study to look at the impacts of this proposal, to look at the impacts of two other subdivision proposals in the eastern portion of Cedra Woolley and see what impacts those would have on citywide. Um, that re that report is also in the record here, and it showed that it did not cause even the even those three together did not cause failure at the one particular intersection that we're concerned about, which is the the intersection of McGurgle and State Route Nine, and also the same intersection as uh, you know John John Liner becomes uh, uh, McGurgle Road. So. We paid particular attention to the impacts on that intersection, and the, the studies showed that they did not. The, this project in particular, and even the pro, those projects with two other projects in mind, did not cause that intersection to fail. So it was information like that that was uh, used and reviewed by the hearing examiner, and uh, it was all part of the public record for the MDNS appeal. That was actually the crux of the appeal. And so it was shown to that the traffic impacts of this, this this development would not cause significant problems. Now, one of the things about a, a um, an age-restricted development is that it doesn't um, it doesn't for our transportation tables that the Public Works Department uses. These are national transportation tables. They do not um, produce the same amount of traffic that a single-family residence does because um, with age-restricted, there's a different uh, number of people coming and going during the day and not going to work every morning necessarily. Um, so there is a, a reduction in the, the percentage. So that was also considered by the hearing examiner and the Public Works Department is in the determination. Yeah, well, that's going to put a lot more traffic on the little Carter Street. I know that. And it, it's too bad they couldn't have an outlet over to Highway 20. All right. So this property is not connected to Highway 20, so that's not an option. No. I have a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Council, uh, Councilwoman. This is uh, Councilwoman Cornegay, and uh, I have a question about the age restriction, actually, um, because so wildflower development wasn't that built as an age restrictive as well, and they weren't able to sell those units under that. Isn't that how that worked? And now it's open to families. Uh, it was not approved. I, I have no recollection of it ever being approved and required to be a age restricted. The, okay. the wild meaning, meaning wildflower, which is a development on fruit that uh, a, a 
Fruitdale, uh, Fruit, Fruitdale near mm -hmm. uh, the Swift Center. Yeah. Okay. So with that, it, now if these don't sell as, um, so regardless of whether or not that happened or not, if these don't sell as age restrictive, then what happens? I mean, would they have to come? I mean, and they're already built. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if they can't sell them, is a, is the seller just out of luck, or does that somehow come back to haunt us? Would they have um, to open it up to families, and then we'll have even that much more traffic? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the 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 HOAs. The HOA says that it's going to be age restricted, so they would have to change their HOAs and they would have to pay um, different city fees. So we do have the, uh, Nikki might be able to help me on this, but um, they, if the HOA requires it to be 55 and over, then the city should have the ability to require that it may re stay 55 and over or they need to do something through the city to to change that. So if the CCNRs say it's a restricted community, then those CCNRs are going to be binding, but that's a civil issue. That's not something that city typically um, gets involved with at that point later on down the line. Um, I haven't looked at your code to determine what <laughs> would occur if there was a desire to just change the character of the neighborhood um which i can certainly do and get back to you at a later date um but typically ccnrs are those are civil issues the enforcement thereof is a civil issue okay thank you thank you so this um, is more i'd like to make a comment just for the good of the order there too um the intersection that has been of concern uh, in addition to the uh, general traffic on McGargo by by the uh, folks who made the appeal was the same intersection we're talking about for the grant application that we're doing right now. And just to kind of explain the process and how it works and how we can do these projects, uh, we, we've identified the intersection at uh, Highway 9 and John Liner McGargo as a as an intersection of interest for some time. It's been in our transportation improvement program for some years. Um, we've accelerated the timeline on that, not specifically because of the development on McGargo, but because when we, uh, at the moment we complete the new uh, Jones John Liner corridor, uh, that intersection's level of service will drop from its present C, which is more than adequate for um, the traffic we have on the road down uh, to below level of service D. Uh, it's it's related to turning motions at the intersection. And just to let you know, the, the way that we fund projects like that, uh, we apply for grants as, as you've approved for us to do, uh, but then we also have to have our local match and the primary source for our local match funds are GMA impact fees. You've heard me say that many times. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it behooves us to support projects that, that uh, do work within our overall plan, our comprehensive plan, because they do support these needed improvements that we have system-wide. Uh, that intersection is challenged not just because of uh, the traffic on McGargo, but also, also because of traffic on Highway 9, and 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 as John mentioned, uh, we we were as Public Works extremely concerned about the cumulative impact of development on that particular intersection, and so we did uh, not one but two uh, reviews of the intersection. They they verified uh, two things: first, that the the intersection currently operates at an adequate level of service. Uh, and secondly, that the, uh, the the development in and of itself of this parcel plus Dukes Hill plus one other one we looked at uh, would not would not drive it below a level of service D. In other words, uh, those those uh, projects from a traffic analysis standpoint would not 
uh, kick in any special requirements for upgrade. Nonetheless, uh, the corridor project will, so it's important for us as a city to uh, move forward with the improvements to that project. And so uh, on that basis, it's, it's a good thing that this project is moving forward to replenish our uh, depleted GMA impact fee fund. And so Public Works, uh, from that aspect, is, is supportive of this. Uh, as you already know, there's been a long process to determine the compliance of the project with our comprehensive plan, which it does. Uh, but strictly from a practical aspect, uh, it furthers our goal of having funds available through GMA impact to fund the needed system improvements that we have from a citywide standpoint. So I just want to make sure I've made that clear to you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more discussion regarding uh, this will be resolution 105420 and it is to um, approve the preliminary plat of Brickyard Park subject to the conditions contained in the hearing examiner's findings of facts, conclusion and recommendations. So I see, I, I, uh, I see Councilman DeYoung has a question or a comment. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I um, have questions as well, um, especially with the traffic and with the input that we received from the city attorney. Uh, I, I think I'm going to need a little further clarification uh, on the issue that uh, Councilman or uh, Council Member Cornegay brought up because that is a concern. And when the attorney says that they're not aware of um, what our uh, ordinance uh, are uh, on that, uh, because basically, and in, in the word I would use here is bait and switch, it'd be something that, you know, the economic uh, viability of this, we're in our second uh, month of a recession. And uh, as we heard in the previous development um, uh, conversation, that you know, there's things ready to go, but then the financing falls flat because of you know economic conditions. And uh, I believe when the attorney is talking about CCNRs, they mean covenants, conditions, and restrictions that are based out of the Homeowners Association or HOA. Um, and uh, talking about that being a civil matter versus something that the city would get involved with. Uh, I, I do have concerns because um, you're asking us to take a, a, a kind of a leap of faith here that uh, it will remain uh, 55 and over, uh, that that does drop on, on the tables for the methodology of how that traffic studies, plural, have happened, multiple, which I truly appreciate that we've done. Um, but that's the biggest thing we're hearing in the community is this traffic is going to have an impact on them. And I walk, I walk through there, I've seen what happens uh, when school uh, is let out. I have grand concerns about what's going to happen on Carter Street uh, because that was not designed to, to take uh, that intensity of, of, of traffic uh, that it's already seeing now. Um, so I, I also am looking at the, the comments that are in the packet uh, of folks that are interested in well, what about the great blue herons that we've seen? Are there some species that are going to be impacted by this? It is relatively close to Brickyard Creek. And that's a very specific question I'd like to have answered now is, uh, will our easements and setbacks uh, that the city has on Brickyard Creek still be um, in play? Uh, are, are those set in stone? Um, uh, uh, and so is there an answer for that one? And then the rest were just, uh, I, I have reservations based upon uh, not uh, not knowing what our ordinances are to kind of, if no, you I can, claw back. I can address Thanks, all Mayor. of those questions. So Thanks, first of all, the application is for a age restricted um, development. The resolution says, you know, whereas Brickyard Creek LLC property owner, Skagit County, parcel number 39374, a 12.7 acre parcel located in Garigal Road, has applied for a preliminary plat approval for the proposed plat of Brickyard Park, a planned residential development, a proposed age restricted 85 lot development. So, in the application, in the resolution, in the hearings examiner findings, it states that it is a age restricted. So to me, this is an age restricted. I don't see any way for them to pull a bait and switch and say that they 
can't because they are approved through the review process for a age restricted development. Yeah, John, I, I really need to I need to come in here a little bit. I really want to make it clear that that's because of economic conditions that the, it was due. That I am not impugning the reputation of the developer in this point. It, this is just something in the future that we we've seen from the past with economic conditions. Well, in well, what I'm if saying, we're talking economic conditions. We need to clarify that we're not in a recession, and I think that it's important for the council to recognize that we can't hold this plat project hostage because of an issue with an intersection that was that has been brought forward to the council, and we've talked about it long before this project even went into came in to anybody's mind. Um, out of everybody on the council, I live the closest to the intersection you're talking about. At times, yes, it's congested. We have multiple traffic studies in front of us. We've talked about the issue, the visibility issue, and those we've gotten the answer from city staff that we're, you know, we're working towards that. But we need to look at just the facts that are in front of us and the nuts and bolts of this and not, you know, just because of a bad intersection, we can't hold up this this project. And you know, we have other developments that are closer to Brickyard Creek than this one. And mm -hmm. so I don't. I I guess if we're looking for a reason, you know, you can look for a reason to hold up anything. But I, you know, I live in this area. You got to put your personal feelings aside, and we just we need to follow what we need to do, you know, and the facts are in front of us. Yeah. Madam Mayor. Yes. Madam Mayor. Mr. Allen. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Councilman Allen. Councilman. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm listening to this with a lot of uh, patience. Anyway, uh, you know, this is past the hearing examiner. I probably planning to commission. Uh, it sounds like we were, I mean, the intention police on what the developers intend for it to be. We are not there to be the police, Carl. I'm sorry, I like you, but we're not there to police. If it's past muster, I understand there's a lot of people that don't like the project. Uh, I don't like, I've lived here for 28 years. I've never had standing water. I will blame it on water coming down from Duke's Hill. But the reality is it's past muster and I don't think we need to grandstand. I'm, I'm Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I want to I want to um, extend my thank you to everyone. I think there's been some really thoughtful discussion and answers here. Um, I do have a comment. So over the last two and a half years, um, attending the senior center for lunches and having an opportunity to visit with a lot of the seniors there. Also the coffee and conversations. Most most of the time are attended by people who are seniors. They have been asking for a development like this. So this is a much needed development we don't have. We don't really don't have this within our community. Um, I think Mark stated it well when he was talking about our GMA. So um, and also uh, beautifully stated uh, Councilman Allen regarding yeah this is this is this ha this is ready to go it's just a matter of whether or not um, we're going to make that motion so I am actually looking for a motion it'll be motion 10 54 20 um, and I'm wondering if anyone is willing to make that motion Madam Mayor Councilman Allen I yes. will make the motion to approve uh, 105420. All right. As written. Right. Second. Councilman Second. DeYoung. Second. Okay. So I have a motion by um, Councilman Allen, seconded by Councilman DeYoung. The motion is to adopt resolution 105420. It approves the preliminary plat of Brickyard Plat subject to the conditions contained in the hearing examiner's findings of fact, conclusion, and recommendation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, Jermaine. Any opposed? 
I, I, I oppose for the traffic reason, that's all. All right, so we have um, six approval and one dissenting vote by Councilman Owen, so motion carries. Okay, again, I wanna thank everybody for the um, the thoughtful discussions and the um, answers that were given. Um, I think you're all very, very skilled. And uh, and if we have um, nothing for the good of the order, I am going to say we are adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.